Was Rachel innocent or guilty? My cousin, Rachel. How soft and gentle her name sounds when I whisper it. It lingers on the tongue, insidious and slow, like poison. It passes from the tongue to the parched lips, and from the lips to the heart. Shall I be free of it one day? There is no going back in life. I cannot call back the spoken word. Rachel. Rachel. We present My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier, Episode 1. I had no sense of foreboding when I sat talking with Ambrose before his last journey. Did he? I promise I'll be back in the spring. I could travel with you down to Rome. No! Apart from my school days, I had never lived in any place but this house. I had come here at the age of 18 months after my young parents died. Ambrose was seized with pity for his small orphan cousin and brought me up himself. He was my guardian, father, brother, counsellor, the god of all creation, in fact my whole world. I never had any desire to be anywhere but home, and Ambrose, I knew, felt exactly the same way. Why must you go? You're feeling well enough, aren't you? I'm damned if I'm going to end my days in a bath chair. And I shall bring back plants. Plants that nobody else has got. Oh, but I don't want to go. Let me come with you. No, not till you're done at Oxford. <sighs> and someone has to look after this place. My eyes are his eyes. My features, his features. It was what I always wanted, to be like him. To have his height, his shyness at first meeting with a stranger. His dislike of fuss. His ease of manner with those who served and loved him and my likeness to him, of which I was so proud, proved my undoing. I want you to cut away the undergrowth down there in the spring. Give us a better view of the sea. And you should make those steps good down to the sand. Have them cut properly. Why don't you stay and do it? Why must I? Same thing. Remember, though, everything I have is yours. Remember that. I do wish you were coming with me. I, I could be ready in an hour. No. You stay. Take care of things. You're my ready-made heir. It's all right. You don't have to feel thankful. When they're all on to me to settle down and rear a family, I hold you up. There's been no need for me to do my duty. you saved me a deal of trouble, Philip. I remember having a pack of women in the house. <laughs> he was courteous, but shy of women. Liked and respected by the neighbours. He hunted in the winter before the rheumatism got its grip. Fished in the summer. But now... His thick, curling hair was turning grey. Oh, Ambrose, let me come with you. No, no, it was just a whim. Forget it. I kept all his letters, thumbed and turned and read them again. It was in a letter from Italy, from Florence, where he'd spent Christmas, that Ambrose first spoke of Cousin Rachel. You have heard me talk about the Corins, who used to have a place up on the Tamar. A Corin married into our family two generations ago, and one of that branch was brought up here by an impecunious father and married off to a nobleman called Sangaletti. He departed this life by fighting a duel, leaving this poor woman with debts and a great empty villa. She is a sensible lady and good company, and has taken it upon herself to show me the gardens in Florence. I missed him, as I always did, but I was glad that Ambrose had found a friend. If I wished for company, I could ride over to visit my godfather, Geoffrey Kendall. They were a feckless lot, the Corins. Gambled away their money and estates. This woman's father must have been Alexander Corin. I believe he disappeared to the continent. Does Ambrose say how old she is? No, only that she'd been married very young. I suppose she's middle-aged. She must be very charming for Ambrose to take notice of her. Geoffrey Kendall's daughter Louise was a playmate of mine from childhood days. I don't think I have ever heard Ambrose admire a woman before. Well, she's probably plain and homely, so he doesn't feel forced to pay her compliments. <laughs> he says he has a real regard for her. He says she's extremely intelligent and knows when to hold her tongue. I think his exact words were, none of that endless yattering. Ah, there you are, Louise. For a space of time, there were no letters. Then, 
Shortly after Easter, finally one came. Dear boy, you will wonder at my silence. The truth is, I never thought I should one day write such a letter to you. Even now I can hardly believe it has happened. My thoughts have gone to you very often. You must know that your cousin Rachel and I were married a fortnight ago. Break the news to everyone. But remember, my dearest boy, that none of this can belittle one jot my deep affection for you. I had just turned 23, but I felt as lonely and lost as if I had just been sent away to school again. I think what shamed me most was the delight of his friends. The best thing that could have happened. Mrs. Pascoe, the vicar's wife, took revenge for past insults she had had to suffer from Ambrose on the holy state of matrimony. What a change there'll be now. No more go as you please for your household, Philip. Some organization will be brought to bear on the servants. And a very good thing, too. Seacombe has had his way for long enough. I don't know what to say, Mr. Philip. A mistress in the house will have everything upside down, and probably no pleasing the lady, whatever is done for her. I think the time has come for me to give way to a younger man. Even Louise Kendall, who knew me well enough, was irritating. And fresh covers in the library, flowers in the house. Oh. The drawing room will come into its own. I always thought it a waste. No doubt Mrs. Ashley will furnish it with pictures from her Italian villa. Oh, for heaven's sake. What's the matter? Oh, you aren't jealous, are you, Philip? Don't be a fool. What's that? We were just wondering about Mrs. Ashley, Papa. Yes, have you made any plans for the future, Philip? Plans? Well, plenty of time, but you'll want to look around here for somewhere of your own. Of my own? Why should I do that? Oh, come, Philip, think. If there should be a family, a son, things won't be the same for you, will they? Oh. But, but perhaps they may have no children. In any case, I'm certain Ambrose won't let you suffer from the change. He will buy you any property you fancy. You might prefer to build. Jealous. Yes, Louise was right about that. Put out of my home and pensioned like a servant. A child arriving who would call Ambrose father so that I should no longer be needed. In my mind, my cousin Rachel took on a dozen personalities, or more, depending on the scraps of information to be gleaned from Ambrose's letters. I imagined her monstrous, like poor Molly Bate, or pale and drawn with an invalidish petulance about her. One moment middle-aged and forceful, the next simpering and younger than Louise. My dear Philip, we have decided to defer our return home until all business is settled. Italian law is one thing, and ours another. I seem to be spending a mint of money, but it's in a good cause. We spent a week in Venice, but both came back creaking from the damp. It is a bitter disappointment, but I shall not travel this winter. When the simpering bride gave way to the aging matron, who had grey hair and arthritic joints from the Venetian mists, my spirits rose. Then, in the winter, the tone of his letters changed. I was never one for headaches, but now I have them frequently, almost blinding at times. I am sick of the sight of the sun. I miss you more than I can say. So much to talk about. Difficult in a letter. Nothing came at Christmas, and I grew worried. At last a letter came, totally unlike himself. Even the handwriting sprawled as if he could not hold the pen. All is not well with me. Better keep silent, though. She watches me all the time. I have no belief in the doctors. They are liars, the whole bunch. But they have taken on a dangerous proposition with me. I will beat them yet. I showed my godfather the letter. Some kind of breakdown. This is not the letter of a man in his right senses. I hope to heaven that... What? Before you were born, of course. What? Your uncle, Ambrose's father, died of a tumour on the brain. I never heard that. It was never much discussed. I'm wondering if it could be hereditary. I think you had better go to Italy. That I have already decided. 
there was no vessel from Plymouth. I was obliged to take the road to London. As the carriage joined the Bodmin Road, we met the groom with the post bag. Stop him, John, you never know. Oh. Is there anything for me? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Philip, for God's sake, come quickly. She has done for me at last. If you delay, it may be too late. Rachel, my torment. Philip. A month later, a carrozza brought me to the gates of the villa. Villa Sangaletti, signor. Thank you. Uh, wait. You will... Wait, please. Thank you. Prego. A woman came to the gate. She stared at me. Mr. Signor Ashley, I'm here to see Mr. Signor Ashley. Ludovico! Ludovico! Che cazzo fai? Say inglese. I've come to see Signor Ashley. You must be Signor Ashley's son. No, his cousin. Forgive me, there is a great resemblance. Are they at home? You have come from England and you have not heard the news. What news? Signor Ashley. He died three weeks ago. Please, sit. I'm all right. I will fetch water. I'm all right. I, I am so sorry, signore, so very sorry. As soon as he is buried, the Contessa, she shut up the villa. She went away. I see. I am so sorry. Is there anything I can do? No. Thank you. If you would like to see the villa, I will open it for you. It is very beautiful, very old, very characteristic. The villa was built round a courtyard, and in the centre of the courtyard was a fountain and the bronze statue of a boy. Beyond the fountain a laburnum tree grew between the paving stones. The golden flowers had long since drooped and died, and now the pods lay scattered on the dusty ground. I think of myself as the happiest of men. The Signor Ashley, he loved this spot. He sit here every day. They take their tisane here after dinner. Day after day, always the same. He liked to look at the water. The end was very sudden. He was very weak from the fever. What was this illness? How long did it last? All winter, the Signore not so well, not himself. He suffered two attacks before the end. Where are all his things? The Contessa took everything away. Where is the Contessa? I do not know. Signor Reinaldi told us the villa is to be let or sold. Too sad for her. Signor Reinaldi... The Signor Reinaldi in the city. He arranged all things for the Contessa. I want to see him. How long have you been in Florence? A few hours only. Ah. Then your cousin Rachel has not seen you? No. Do you know where she is now? She left very suddenly. She made no plans. She told me she would write. Why was I not informed that he was ill? He had been ill, yes, but not as we thought, uh, dangerously. Fever attacks many foreigners. Uh, Mrs. Ashley hoped for some improvement. She had no idea to make you uh, anxious. Yes, but I was anxious. I received letters. <laughs> This note, last of all. Yes. Mrs. Ashley feared something like this. The doctors warned her. Warned her? Of what? And that there might be something pressing on his brain. A tumor or growth which would account for his condition. A tumor that killed him. Unquestionably. These are not the letters of a sick man. These are the letters of a man who has enemies. I saw him in us last weeks. Forgive me, but you did not. The experience was not a pleasant one. Mrs. Ashley, he did not leave him night or day. That did not help, did it? I have written to your guardian, Mr. Kendall. I have explained to him fully, in great detail, everything that happened. <sighs> If I had been here, he would not have died. You are very young, are you not, Mr. Ashley? 
Will you be staying long in Florence? No. I left his house and walked onto the bridge across the Arno. I stared down at the river, watching it surge and flow and lose itself in the darkness. I made a vow to myself. I swore that whatever it had cost Ambrose in pain and suffering, I would return it in full measure. I did not believe Rinaldi. Someday, somehow, I would repay my cousin Rachel. How are you bearing up, Philip? It's very strange. I am Mr. Ashley now. Yes. I'll have all this to look after, to carry on for him. I am, I don't know, proud. Good. Of course it will not be yours in law until you're 25. Ambrose said no young man knows his own mind until then. But it won't affect you, except that you'll have to call upon me for money, as you have always done. It's only another few months. You never saw your cousin Rachel? No, she crept off with all his things the day after they put him in the ground. Oh, you don't begrudge her the books and clothes, do you? Hang it all, Philip. It's all she has. How do you mean? Well, you've heard the will. I drew it up ten years ago. It has not changed. There is no provision in it for a wife. Everything goes to you. I expected some word from Ambrose after the marriage. I'm quite surprised that this Italian, Signor Reynaldi, whom you seem so much to dislike, makes no mention of any sort of claim on the part of Mrs. Ashley. It shows great delicacy. Claim? When we know she drove him to his death? We know nothing of the sort. Oh, so you believe the story of the tumour? Naturally, I believe it. Philip, face facts. We both loved him. I am as distressed as you when I think of his mental suffering, but he was not himself. I don't believe it. Then for God's sake, keep it to yourself. If a whisper of this came to his widow, she would be well within her rights to bring a case of slander. And if I were her man of business, as this Italian seems to be, I would not hesitate to do so. I took tea with Louise and told her all about it. Perhaps you are right. Your father does not think so. I dare say poor Mr. Ashley and his wife were not happy. And he was too proud to tell you so before he fell ill. And then perhaps they had a quarrel, and everything happened at once, and so he wrote you those letters. What did the servant say about her? Was she young, old? I never asked. He must have felt so lonely. Yes. You should have asked that Reynaldi what she looked like. It would have been my first question. Wasn't her first husband killed in a duel? She probably had lovers. Yes, stilettos in a shadow doorway, secret staircases. How like a girl to think of that. Oh. Look, whether she had a hundred lovers or not doesn't concern me. One day I will hunt... Yes, father. What is it, Papa? The post has come. I think you should see this, Philip. It's from your cousin Rachel. She's in Plymouth. She's brought his possessions for you. She asks what she should do with them. She asks nothing else. She is staying alone in a boarding house. If you will not offer hospitality, then I shall. Why should you imagine I don't wish to see her? Tell her my house is at her disposal when she cares to visit it. Very good. I shall draft a reply. Philip, what do you intend? Will you really dare to question her? I can't say until I've seen her. She'll try to bluster her way out, or swoon and have hysterics, maybe. I was confident that when I had actual speech with my cousin Rachel, I should find my tongue. And word came that my invitation had been accepted. And the day came all too soon. I've brought Michaelmas daisies and dahlias. Thank you. These for her dressing room. I thought Seacombe might be glad of them. You should not have troubled, Miss Louise. I can arrange them. I suppose you have vases, or will I have to make do with jam pots? Well, I expect we have a jug or two. I'll take them, Miss Candle. Thank you, Seacombe. Do you want me to stay when she comes? Shall I? The flowers were only an excuse. No, I can manage. You can go and inspect her boudoir, if you like. You're nervous. No, I'm not. I could... I can manage... You know I shall be longing to hear everything. If you don't send me some word, I shall be wondering the whole time. 
Wondering what? If you have thrown her over the headland. I will ride over tomorrow afternoon and paint a vivid picture for you. That will do very well. I judged that the carriage would not be home earlier than five, so I determined to take a long tramp round the estate. I walked ten miles in the rain and did not return until after six. Well, Madame has come. Where is she now? Gone to her room, sir. She asked you to excuse her for dinner. I had a tray taken up to her about an hour ago. All right. Madame said that if you should wish to see her when you have dined, she will be pleased to receive you. Thank you, Seekham. Yes, sir. I took my solitary meal and after it a glass of brandy. Then I went upstairs and knocked on the door of the little boudoir. Come in. Good evening. I hope you're rested. Oh, thank you. Yes. I owe you an apology for not coming down to dinner, but I was very tired. Seacombe told me how busy you were. I don't want you to feel hampered in any way by my visit. Of course not. I just want to say one thing, which is thank you, Philip, for letting me come. It can't have been easy for you. It was such a strange feeling driving through the park and up to the house. I've done it so many times, you know, in fancy. We used to talk about the journey home. He would tell me about the gardens and the woods and the path down to the sea. I fear you had rough weather for the drive. It did not worry me. It was clever of you to let me have these rooms. They were the ones we meant to use. Well, I hope you'll be comfortable. Nobody seems to have been here since someone called Aunt Phoebe. Aunt Phoebe, who fell lovesick of a curate and went away to Tunbridge to mend a broken heart. Did you never hear the story? No. <laughs> Tea is served, ma'am. Oh, thank you, Seacom. Just put it down here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Would you like some tea? This silver is beautiful. <laughs> to tell you the honest truth, I've never seen this tray before in my life. Nor the kettle, nor the teapot. <laughs> I didn't think you had. I saw the amazement in your eyes. It's buried treasure. He must have dug for it in the cellar. <clears throat> Thank you. You may smoke your pipe if you wish. Are you sure? When Mrs. Pascoe comes with the vicar, we never smoke in the drawing room. This is not the drawing room, and I am not Mrs. Pascoe. Seacom will smell it in the morning. I will open the window before I go to bed. I thought women minded about such things. They do, when they have nothing else to worry them. Take a light from the fire. It struck me as I sat smoking my pipe that this was not at all what I had intended. She finished her tea and put her cup back on the tray. I was aware of her hands, narrow and small and very white. She bore no resemblance to any of the images I had created. Anger seemed futile now, and hatred too. How could I fear anyone who did not measure up to my shoulder and had nothing remarkable about her except small hands? I had blown a bubble in the air, and now it had burst. I was glad of my pipe stem to bite on. It made me feel less of a sleepwalker muddled by a dream. Philip. <laughs> uh, you are nodding. I beg your pardon. Go to bed. Yes. Yes. Good night. Good night. Cousin Rachel. I've been out since half past ten. I looked for you but could not find you. So I did a bold thing and made myself known to Tamlin. <laughs> you did, ma'am. You see, Philip, I brought with me to Plymouth, they are there in a warehouse, all the plants Ambrose and I collected. I thought I should talk over the list with Tamlin. 
That's all right. I've learned things this morning, Mr. Phillips, sir. Mrs. Ashley knows more about gardening than I do. Nonsense, Tamlin. I only know about trees and shrubs. <laughs> and you haven't taken me round the walled garden yet. Whenever you wish, ma'am. Thank you. My garden at the villa was very lovely. He must have told you. Yes. When I was young and first married, I am not referring to Ambrose, I was not very happy. So I distracted myself designing afresh the gardens there. But this is what I've always wanted to see. This is different. At dinner, Seacombe placed her on my right hand, and both he and John waited on us. Then we sat together by the library fire, and she brought out some piece of embroidery and began work on it. Cousin Philip, tell me what is the matter. There isn't anything. Don't that... deny there is something. I'm not entirely welcome. Nonsense. Have I said something to hurt you? No. What is it then? Uh, I had a letter in July. And then another. Just a note. Not long before... Before he... Do you have them still? They're in my pocket. May I see? Her face was very pale as she read, but she was dressed in deep black, which took the colour from her complexion. Her hair was brown, parted in the centre, her features neat and regular. She was so small. The only thing large about her were her eyes. How you must have hated me. Yes. Why did you ask me here? To accuse you. Of what? I'm not sure. Breaking his heart. And then? I don't know. Just to make you suffer. You have got what you wanted. If you had not loved him quite so much, I could talk to you about those letters. I won't, though. I'd rather you condemned me. I will go. You need never think about me again. I don't condemn you. I can't go on hating a woman who doesn't exist. But I do exist. You are not the woman I hated. Did this woman take shape when you read the letters? Before. In a sense, I was relieved when the letters came. They gave me a reason for hating you. Before, I had none. I, I was ashamed. Of what? Of my jealousy. Everyone expected me to be delighted. The trouble is that I've never loved anyone in the world but Ambrose. That was his trouble too. What do you mean? Marriage... Marriage came late for him. I don't know why he turned to me. Who can say why this man should love that woman? What chemical mix-up in our blood draws us to one another? I know what he was to me, but he was like someone sleeping who woke suddenly and found the world. Beauty, sadness, hunger and thirst, magnified into one person who happened to be me. Rinaldi, whom he detested, by the way, as you probably did too, said that Ambrose wakened to me just as some men wake to religion. But a man who gets religion can pray all day to Our Lady. She is made of plaster and does not change. Women are not so. You mean he expected too much of you? No. Waking to the world did not help Ambrose. His nature changed. How? The doctors said it was his illness that qualities lying dormant all his life came to the surface through pain and fear. Something in me brought out those qualities. Finding me was ecstasy to him and then catastrophe. You were right to hate me. He might have become ill just the same. Then I would have borne the brunt of it. He loved you so much. He was so proud of you. My Philip would do this, my boy would do that. If you'd been jealous, so have I. I hated you. The spoilt boy who has no faults, who holds three quarters of his heart. I think we are quits. Yes. 
I'm glad we had this talk before I go. Go? Where are you going? Your godfather has invited me. But you've only just arrived. You can't go yet. The people on the estate would be deeply offended. Would they? Um, what about all the plants in Plymouth? And Ambrose things to sort out? You can do that. We could do it together. What is it? You look so like him. Light me upstairs, please. With pleasure. You don't hate me anymore? No. I told you it was another woman. Are you still jealous of me? That horrid boy, so spoiled and prim. <laughs> he went yesterday, when you walked into Aunt Phoebe's boudoir. The next day was Sunday. I gave order for the carriage, and my cousin Rachel, prepared for the event by Seacombe when he took her breakfast, was handed into it on the stroke of ten. I believe I'm slightly nervous. With good reason. All eyes will be on you in the church. They'll be standing in the aisles. I'm not sure I know how to behave. I was bred a Catholic. Mm, well, keep that to yourself. Papists are only fit for hellfire in this part of the world. You terrify me. Just watch what I do. They won't like that veil. They want to see your face. Then they must want. You don't understand. Nothing like this has happened for 30 years. For the younger ones, there has never been a Mrs. Ashley come to church before. Stop the carriage. I'm going back. Don't panic. My godfather and Louise will be there. Oh, heavens. What is it? Well, I've only just remembered I promised Louise I would ride over yesterday afternoon. That was not very gallant of you. <sighs> I shall blame it on you, which will be the truth. If I were Louise, I would take that in bad part. You could not offer a woman a worse excuse. Louise isn't a woman. She's younger than me. She has feelings just the same, I dare say. And now to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. did that very well, but your real ordeal is now before you. Delighted to see you, Mrs. Ashley. Uh, thank you. Mrs. Pascoe. Good morning, Mrs. Ashley. And your charming daughters. <laughs> very good. Here's my godfather and Louise. You shall not have it all your own way. What do you mean? Mrs. Ashley. Very glad to see you. May I introduce my only daughter, Miss Louise Kendall? So pleased to make your acquaintance. We are all lunching together. Yes, indeed. Then, Philip, why don't you conduct Miss Kendall to your carriage, <sighs> and I will go with Mr. Kendall? Uh, why, why, certainly. If you prefer it. Look here, Louise, I'm so sorry about yesterday. Oh, don't apologise. It did not matter. I'm really very sorry. Well... What happened? Tell me all. All? Oh, what did you say to her? How did she take it? Did she show any sign of guilt? We had little time for talking. She is a very different sort of person from what I thought she would be. You can see that, surely. She's very beautiful. Beautiful? <laughs> did you not see how the people stared when she put up her veil? Perhaps she has fine eyes, but otherwise she's quite ordinary. I feel quite at ease with her. Ordinary or not, she seems to have made a great impression on you. How old do you think she is? About 35, I would say. I haven't the remotest idea. She could be 99 for all I know. Don't be ridiculous. She dresses well. Morning becomes her. You sound like Mrs. Pascoe. <sighs> Not since Ambrose had been home the year before had I known a Sunday pass so swiftly. I sat at the head of the table, where Ambrose had always sat, and my cousin Rachel at the far end. Mrs. Pascoe forgot even to snap her jaws at her husband. And then our kitchen maid was brought to trouble by the garden boy. Oh, dear. What I cannot understand, Mrs. Ashley, is where it happened. She shared a room with Cook. And as far as we knew, never left the house. The cellar? Oh, yeah. oh gracious! Oh. <laughs> My cousin drew the vicar out until he quoted poetry. Vivamos mea lesbia atque amemus. 
and I had never seen my godfather enjoy himself so much. <laughs> Only Louise seemed silent and withdrawn, but I was much too entertained to worry about her sulking. When the port was put on the table, I did not know whether I should rise. I looked across at my cousin. She smiled. We seemed to hold each other for a moment. It was queer, strange. The feeling went right through me as never before. I love the stillness of a room after a party.、Mm. Ambrose used to say that it was worth the tedium of visitors to experience the pleasure of their going. <laughs> Usually, I find Sundays a great bore. I'm not a conversationalist. That's where a woman can be useful. I can't think what you did to make it all so pleasant. Yeah, so it was pleasant. Yes. Then you had better hurry up and marry your Louise and have a real hostess. That'd be absurd, and she isn't my Louise. I rather thought she was. I have never considered her as a wife, and I don't intend to. Poor Louise. And what is this nonsense about you going to the Kendalls? Your godfather has invited me to stay. What's wrong with this house? Nothing, as yet. And you must pay your respects to the tenants. We must visit each of the farms in turn, and the county will come to call. They're already leaving cards. Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. Those are the visiting days. No.、Oh. And what shall I do on Mondays and Wednesdays? Um, do you sketch? I'm afraid you are drawing up a program of leisure for which I'm ill-suited. If instead of waiting for the county to call upon me, I call upon them for the purpose of giving them lessons in Italian, that would suit me much better. Only spinsters give lessons. And what do widows do? Marry again or sell their rings? I see. Well. I prefer giving lessons. Good night. Good God! What had I said? How blundering! How unfeeling! What on earth could have possessed me? No provision for Mrs. Ashley, and I had made a joke of it. The very thought made me writhe with shame and embarrassment. Something would have to be done. The matter's a delicate one. I must have time to think this out. Everyone knows she has been left nothing. We must do something for her now. I'm very glad that you changed your attitude. I was mistaken. We can forget all that. Well then, let us arrange a quarterly allowance. Excellent. Now, as to the sum, what do you suggest? What is the Barton rent at the moment? That would cover it. Well, that is generous. She'll hardly need as much as that. For God's sake! If we're going to do this, let's not be niggardly. Um, It should atone、uh, for the will. Very well. I'll write to the bank. Thank you. Don't forget to see Louise before you go. Have some cake. You must be hungry from your ride.、Oh, I'm sorry, Louise. I have to go. I only rode over on business. I see. How is Mrs. Ashley? Well, and exceedingly busy. The shrubs she brought from Italy arrived this morning. She's planting them out with Tamlin. I should have thought you would have stayed at home to help her. You haven't got over your ill humour, then. I don't know what you mean. You were in a vile temper the whole of Sunday. I wonder Mrs. Pascoe did not remark on it. She was probably far too busy remarking on something else. And what was that? How simple it is for a woman of the world like Mrs. Ashley to twist a young man like you around her finger. What have you been doing? Nothing. Why? Don't lie, Philip. You don't know how. You went to see your guardian. What if I did? You made him write this letter. He wrote it of his own accord. It happened that there were various matters to discuss, and, and you told him your cousin Rachel proposed giving lessons in Italian. <sighs> Not exactly. You don't realise what you have done. You make me feel utterly ashamed. I don't see why you have to be so proud. Proud. How dare you call me proud? It was not a joke when you said about giving lessons. You meant it. And if I did mean it, is there anything shameful in it? For Mrs. Ambrose Ashley to give lessons in Italian, yes, it reflects upon the husband who neglected to make provision for her, and I, his heir, won't permit it. You will take the money, and remember, it comes from your husband. Do you understand? For a moment, I thought she was going to hit me. Then her eyes filled with tears, and she pushed past me. Went into her bedroom and slammed the door. I went down to dinner and poured myself a glass of claret. 
Christ, I thought, so that's how women behave. Let her stew. An hour later, I was knocking gently on her bedroom door. Who is it? Philip. Can I come in? I'm sorry. It was very generous of you. I have written a note to your guardian saying I accept. Thank you. It was not pride. What I could not bear was when you said it would reflect badly on Ambrose. We need not think of it again. I must have seemed so ungracious. Please, forget it. I think next week I should leave here and move. Perhaps to London. Why? I only came for a few days. Well, I, I thought you liked it. If you want to go, go. It would cause a lot of talk. I should have thought it would cause more talk if I stayed. I don't know what you mean. Listen, I like it now you're here. And I don't want you to go. Is that complicated? Yes, very. You told me this morning I need a designer to lay out the plants in the garden as Ambrose would have wanted it. Yes. Stay here for a few months and do it, knowing what it would have meant to him. I should ask your godfather. It does not concern him. If you really want to go, I can't keep you. You know I want to stay. So how on earth... Then you will remain for a little while. Yes. And not be angry with me anymore. No. <laughs> Come here. Here. Thank you, Philip. Now go to bed. Shrubs first, starting here. What do you think? Well, I tell you, I don't know. I have no eye for it. Cut down all the trees, dig up all the banks, plant in rows, or do whatever you want. But I want the result to please you. All this belongs to you, and one day will belong to your children. <laughs> they will eat fruit from these little saplings. Children? I am quite resolved to remain a bachelor. Oh, don't be stupid. I should be spared much distress and anxiety of mind. Have you ever thought what you would lose? I have a shrewd idea that the blessings of married bliss are not all they are claimed to be. If a man wants warmth and comfort, he can get all that from his own house. <laughs> One day, when you fall in love, I shall remind you of those words. Warmth and comfort from stone walls at 24. Oh, of course, I know what you mean. It just happens that I've never been moved in that way. You must be a heartbreak to the neighbourhood. Poor Louise. I, I will not discuss her. Mrs. Pascoe tells me you are the despair of every mother within 50 miles. So tall, so presentable, so eligible. If they only knew, he longs only for his four stone walls. But can't people think of anything else? <laughs> they haven't much else to think about. I do not escape discussion, I can tell you. You? A list of eligible widowers has been given me. A peer down in the west of the county declared to be the very thing. Fifty, no heir, and both daughters married. No, not old St. Ives. They say he's charming. I mean, he's always drunk by midday and creeps around the passages after the maids. Billy Rowe had a niece in service there. She had to come back home. She grew so scared. Perhaps if he had a wife, he would not do so. You are not going to marry him. We could at least invite him here for dinner. We could have a party. The prettiest young women for you and the best favoured widowers for me. Get back to your digging. <laughs> At the end of the month, the fine weather broke. It rained for three days without stopping, and no gardening could be done. The weather being so inclement, sir, I thought the boys might be put to extra cleaning. Your old room needs attention, sir, but Mr. Ashley's trunks and boxes are all over the floor. You're quite right to seek him. We've left it far too long. Philip? Very well. Let's have the fire lit and go through them. Shall we open the clothes trunk first? As you will. Dressing gown. Shooting coat. What shall we do with them? I don't know. Would you wear them if I gave them to you? No, no, I don't think so. Well, we might give them to the people on the estate here. Mm. They might like to have them. Uh, the trunk.
trunk, would you like? A trunk is always useful. <laughs> Rachel, please don't cry. <laughs> Look, go back to the library. I can do it. No, it's just as bad for you as it is for me. You loved him so. I don't mind. Let me do it. Oh, now I've got tears all over your shirt. Uh, I'm better now. I can do it now, there. It won't happen again. Let's start with the books. Yes, good. Uh, that'll be easier. We took the books out and she dusted them, and we laid them on the floor. She found a gardening book and took it to the window to see it better. I opened another at random. A piece of paper fell from between the leaves. It had Ambrose's handwriting on it. It seemed like the middle scrap of a letter. It's a disease, of course, like kleptomania, and no doubt handed down to her by her spendthrift father. It explains much of what has disturbed me. I dare not any longer let her have command over my purse, or I shall be ruined and the estate will suffer. It is imperative that you warn Kendall. What have you there? Nothing. Was that Ambrose's handwriting? No, it was just a note. A scrap. Nothing. I threw it on the fire. She watched it burn, but said nothing. I wish to heaven I had not come upon it. Have you shown Mr. Philip the new coverings, madam? No, Seacombe, not yet. What coverings? I told you I ordered coverings for the blue room. I have seen nothing like them in my life, sir. No mansion in these parts has anything to touch them. Would you like to see the coverings, Philip? Um, yes. It's all spread out in the library, sir. This blue for the bed hangings, and the deeper blue and gold for the curtains. Oh, there's quality for you. Do you not like them? Yes. Are they... are they not very dear? Oh, yes, but it'll last for years. Your great-grandson will be able to sleep with these coverings on his bed. Isn't that so, Seacombe? Yes, madam. The only thing that matters is whether you like them. Who could help but like them? <laughs> <laughs> then they are yours. They're a present to you from me. <laughs> there, Seacombe, he approves. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Something is the matter. What is it? You should not give me a present like this. It will cost you far too much. But you have done so much for me. They come from Italy. There's only one place in London that deals with them. What was really on that piece of paper you threw in the fire this morning? What paper? You know perfectly well. It was a piece of a draft of a letter. He expressed himself as worried about expenditure. There was only a line or two. I thought it would have saddened you. Was that all? Yes. Poor Ambrose. He resented the life I had to lead before I met him. But he paid my debts. He was so generous. You cannot imagine, Philip, what it meant to me. Someone I could trust, someone I could love. It was so hard when he changed. Changed? Oh. If I asked him for money, for anything, things we needed, he would not give it. He would ask me why. Was I going to give it to anyone? In the end, I had to go to Rinaldi. I had to ask Rinaldi for money to pay the servants' wages. He said I watched him. Well, I did. I watched him lest he should do himself some harm. He asked me to dismiss the servants. <laughs> Oh, God, I did not mean to tell you all this. Why not? I wanted you to remember him as he was here. Your Ambrose. We should not have opened the trunks. We've let something loose. No, no, it's all over and done with. You are so like him. I see your eyes. The same expression. It's as though he had not died. After all, and everything must be endured once more. Oh, I could not bear it again. 
the suspicion, the bitterness. Rachel, there is no bitter feeling in this house. You're going to remember him as I remember him. You belong here now, just as he did, as I do. We shall be part of the place, all together. Do you understand? Yes. I only want you to be happy. In the old days, at Christmas, Ambrose gave dinner to the tenants. I had let it lapse. But now I decided to host the dinner once again, if only for the reason that Rachel would be there. One thing gave me anxiety. What could I give Rachel for a Christmas present? And then the solution came to me. I like this necklace. I would price the rubies higher, but there is a family feeling about the pearls. Your grandmother wore them as a bride. Then your aunt, Mrs. Philip, your own mother wore them on her wedding day. In fact, she was the last to do so. I remember your mother's wedding. They became her well. I'll take them. Is that wise? It would be dreadful if this should be lost or mislaid. <laughs> it won't be lost. Would your guardian? I will be... make it right with him. Of course, in April all this will be yours outright. It would not matter if you took the whole collection. I have written out the names of all, and Seacombe has placed them on the platters. Seacombe and the boys are decorating the tree. When do the carriage folk arrive? Uh, the Kendalls and the Pascoes are coming at five. Oh, are you excited? <laughs> I'm like a child. What is it? No, I can't wait to give you a present. Here. Oh, what is it? My mother wore this last. Now it belongs to you. I want you to wear it tonight, and always. Oh, Philip! I've never given a present to a woman. Oh, I tell you frankly, you've made an excellent beginning. Uh, the clasp. Yes, of course. Oh, Philip! The pearls glowed soft and white against her skin. She gazed at them in the hall mirror, and suddenly I saw that Louise had been right. Rachel was beautiful. She turned to me. Philip. She put her arms about me and held me to her. There were tears in her eyes, but tonight I did not mind. Then she kissed me again, and as I stood there, holding her. I thought to myself, it was not yearning for home nor sickness of the blood, but for this that Ambrose died. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please, um, um, may I just say, um, uh, a happy Christmas to you all. Oh. 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 And to Mrs. Ashley. Yes, of course, Mrs. Ashley. I was walking out one summer summer's evening time when I beheld those beautiful that went well, I think. The vicar ate for three. Mrs. Pascoe had to roll him into their carriage. Where are the ladies? Louise and Mrs. Ashley went upstairs. They will be down in a moment. Or Billy so. Rowe may have taken a little too much cider, I think. <laughs> they made me laugh. Philip. What? What is it? I had a communication from Mr. Couch. Oh, the pearls. No, the... not the pearls. Mr. Couch informed me that Mrs. Ashley is heavily overdrawn on her account. I beg your pardon? I don't understand it. She has few expenses here. The only thing that occurs to me is that she's sending money out of the country. She's very generous. She's taken it upon herself to spend money on the house. The sum we decided upon has been trebled. What are we to do? 
obviously what we gave her was not sufficient. You must treble the allowance. Now, that is preposterous. And it's true, you had no right to take that collar from the bank. I can do what I like with it, it's mine. Not for another three months. I met some old friends in Exeter, great travellers. They winter in Italy. It seems they met your cousin when she was married to Sangaletti. So? Both were notorious for unbridled living and loose living. Also, I I'm sorry for Well, that. I did not think that you would listen to gossip. I must ask you to desire her to return the collar. How can I possibly do that? It's the last thing I could do in the world. Then I must do it for you. I'll be damned if you will. I am sorry. I could not help overhearing. It was dear of Philip to let me wear the pearls. And quite right of you, Mr. Kendall, to ask for their return. No, why should you? Please, Philip. Thank you, Mrs. Ashley. Philip had no business to take it. I perfectly understand. Here. Thank you. I think that now I will say goodnight. You must not mind. Please, Philip. I wanted you to wear it. I wanted you to keep it. God damn him. Shh. Oh, poor Philip. My mother wore those pearls on her wedding day. Don't you see why I wanted you to wear them too? Because you know that had I been married here and not Florence, Ambrose would have given them to me on our wedding day. I said nothing. But that was not the reason. In My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier, Leah Williams played Rachel, Carl Prekop, Philip, and Damien Lewis, Ambrose. Paul Jessen played Geoffrey, Hugh Ross, Seacombe, Emily Wachter, Louise, Nicholas Murchie, Rinaldi, John McAndrew, Ludovico and Tamlin, Carol McCready, Mrs. Pascoe, and John Rogan, the vicar. All other parts were played by members of the cast. The book was adapted for radio by Robin Brooks and the music composed by Dominique Legendre. My Cousin Rachel was produced and directed by Clive Brill and was a Pacificus production for BBC Radio 4.